Okay, uh, pixel texture node. I want to talk a little bit more about that. We have some changes that I think we should uh, uh, add to the video delivery so far. So uh, SF image type, that is, uh, of course, exactly correct. But something uh, that could be brought out a little better is the hexadecimal. So I've taken that from notes at the bottom of the page and made it uh, outside the page and made it a full-fledged slide here along with some uh, numeric examples on how this works and of course this is uh, just base 16 arithmetic here uh, uh, B is 11 uh, E is 14 and we can also uh, say that, okay, 16 cubed, 16 squared, 16 to the first. This is really times 16 to the zero or one. Okay, so that's how we do different base arithmetic, and most people are familiar with that. But wait, we're not quite done. There's a little more when you do that. You have to then, uh, yikes, what's going on now? Uh, what else? You can uh, take those values and you still have to convert it to red, green, blue. And so to do that, we divide by 255 if you want that correlation. And so we've continued the math, or at least the arithmetic, for this single example, which is uh, figuring out the corresponding RGB value for this guy here. Okay, pretty straightforward arithmetic. So we have to pay close attention to how many digits are in each value that's in an SF image. So uh, that's something that was incorrect in the uh, previous example and in fact uh, was incorrect in the book. So we uh, uncovered an errata Erratum yesterday. Uh, when I was doing the counting, that was uh, way off base. Each value here has to be an independent value. So three times two, four components. That means we should have six numbers. And each number includes four components within it. So how that breaks out is uh, uh, very important. But this is the, the key point. Each single numeric value is a single uh, set of component values. So, so let's elaborate that even further here. And here's the examples pulled out. If you look at these numbers in the, in the hex value column on the left, those exactly match uh, some of the values here uh, on that table. And so we're just elaborating on them. These are the, uh, uh, we put another column in here saying number of components. Then this would be two, three, and four. And this is elaborating the examples once again on the preceding page. So if we look at the values, we see zero X F F that equals the value 255, uh, probably familiar to most folks. And you can do the math on those. You can also simply uh, pull up a calculator. Your, uh, uh, your operating system may vary, but Windows actually has a pretty handy calculator. If you haven't seen it before, I'll put it up here. Uh, calculator. And what's cool about this is if you change the view from standard, which is what you usually get, to scientific, you get a full bore, uh, looks so almost like a Hewlett Packard calculator here. So if we want to say, well, gee whiz, what is FF? We click on the uh, hex button, FF, and then simply select the mode of decimal, and boom, presto, there's our value. So this can be uh, definitely helpful 
if you want to do some uh, precise computation and don't want to break out pencil and paper and multiply it all out yourself. Okay, so I've tried to split it out then in terms of uh, which is which since uh, the two component is just a black white uh, uh, and uh, oh, I'm sorry I'm misspeaking here my goodness I'm gonna have to start rehearsing I think uh, this would be a one component get it out of there one two three and four how's that work a little better uh, again that's number of components and from the preceding page so uh, for one component it's either going to be uh, uh, well it's, it's going to be a black to white intensity value and so that's what we show there 255 is full up intensity or white zero is zero intensity or black Shades of gray are also possible. And we see some of those shades of gray in the next one, where we get uh, CC and 22 are the color, excuse me, the intensity component. So that's 204 and 34, respectively. And finally, we get the alpha channel or Opposite of transparency value and 255 is FF again, 77 is 119, and they correspond to uh, transparencies of 0 and 0 0.53. Okay, so uh, and those colors are shown right here. Same thing. Okay, how about the three component? We're breaking it down once again, FF0000. Three component means RGB. So red, green, blue values on a scale of zero to 255. You can see that, uh, of course, we have uh, uh, red there and uh, green here. Didn't do a blue on this one. white and yellow. And then finally we have uh, some four component values and the four component are red, green, blue plus once again alpha. Okay so those numbers were pulled out from the preceding page and laid there. And then to confirm all of this I put a, uh, uh, we had this example but it must have been buggy before that the fourth one escaped us. But now there is a working example right now, and it's called uh, uh, Pixel Texture Component Examples. If we, uh, well, we can just uh, undock XJ3D, which currently is the best, perhaps only tool that's properly doing, seems to properly do all of the component values. And you can see it's similar to the diagram in the book. If we rotate this, you can tell which of the uh, which of these cubes have some transparency in it, and that would be number two and number four uh, have transparency. Our alpha channel. And I guess I can't keep the in cup and drive to drive two, so we'll, we'll move it around. And you can see, sure enough, number two and number four, you can see through them into the uh, checkerboard behind, whereas the other color maps you can't. All right. Is that okay on the color, or should we keep the top layer? You guys can see the transparency now. On the recording, the transparency will look just fine. You can you can bring the lights back up. 
And, but I, once again, on projectors, their color gamut is not as effective as your uh, machine or a screen capture of the machine. And so that's why we uh, turn off the lights for a sec. Okay. And then we have our same examples as before. Now there's one other feature that's pretty cool, and that is the, uh, let's get it up here. That is conversion into, uh, of an image into a pixel texture. Because that's, well, if there's a more tedious task than converting pixels by pixels one by one into hexadecimal, I'm not sure what it is. But, uh, okay, tedious task. Gee, what a good thing from our program to do. So uh, Louis Gutierrez, a uh, student several years ago in this class, in the advanced class, wrote a very nice uh, Java utility that could load images and spit out pixel texture values, uh, did that conversion. So his class is available in the uh, Savage archive. I give the address and the uh, uh, invocation right there. But also note that uh, just like we did in the example yesterday, this is now embedded in X3 Edit. And so we can uh, um, just click on that guy to uh, load a file and change it. Now, when we say file sizes are drastic, your mileage may vary, but some numbers we've seen have been a factor of 25 times bigger file size, pre-compression. Yeah, so, so you don't want to use this for the family portrait of uh, all 30 people at the wedding last weekend. Uh, but for small images, it can be uh, used. It will be further interesting to see, uh, uh, as we get more adept at this, how effective our compressed binary comp encoding might be at uh, pixel texture. And that might actually become even more viable as uh, a method. Okay, if you want to see any more about that, the README on this slide does give some more details about Pixel Texture Generator, as well as the uh, scene that we use that once you, if you use the command line, you can cut and paste its output into this template to uh, turn it into X3D. Okay, so there is Pixel Texture Update. Next up, let's get queued up here, is, uh, I guess we'll do the movie texture, get that block, that's the one that was out of order and that will go previous and then we'll finish the chapter. I just renamed and broke a figure this morning, so leave the camera running but not use this session. This illustrates the problem we have with some of the slide sets. Um, the new texture figure. Slide set on the mm -hmm. slide sixty eight. Uh, pixel section generator. Okay. One sec. You're correct. One sec. Let me uh, let me get this guy in place for the presentation. This is illustrating. Uh, a problem I have with OpenOffice, uh, sometimes it does relative file links instead of just dropping the image in the file, and it's not clear how I force that or not. So if you always want to have the images, as was reported on the mail list last night, use the PDF, and, and it should be there. Okay, so Ben, uh, you said slide 68. And what's the problem, Ben? It's fine there. Oh, okay. Which numbers are wrong? Uh, all of them. Uh, is it just a different slide? I don't know. How the same slide? The numbers are. It looks like OpenOffice translates into Arabic. 
Oh, really? In the PDF? Yeah. I see. Okay. Could we uh, get that in the minutes for today, please? And I'll follow up on that. Thank you very much. Okay, so now movie texture, one of the coolest notes and one of the most uh, challenging to get right, at least to get the software right. We can, we can definitely author with it and we hope to get uh, the performance even better. So how does movie texture work? Well, it's almost exactly like image texture for starters. You can take a movie and drape it across geometry. And what does it use for the imagery? Well, it uses either the entry screen, if it's uh, uh, just starting there, or the movie itself as it plays through. Because you can think of a movie as a series of 2D images, one right after the other. And as we read a movie file, we're just pushing through that stack and peeling off one image at a time. Well, you can think of that in 3D terms. That's a pretty good metaphor because then each image is getting draped over the geometry. If it's a rectangle matching the size of the uh, movie, then that's what we would see right there is the movie playing inside our 3D world. Okay. Now, people do uh, usually uh, avoid getting too wild and crazy with their, their movies because, first of all, watching the movie locks you right into a viewpoint if you want to see it. Usually, second, uh, the 3D is a bigger place. Third, uh, movie bandwidth and movie uh, performance can be a handicap. At least historically, they have been. We are seeing uh, better results nowadays as, as some of the encoders get better and as uh, the ability to stream movies uh, is improving so that network download doesn't become quite as much a problem. But that's still very uh, user dependent. Where is your user? What access do they have? Have they had the chance to install everything first or not? Um, uh, so you still have to be asking and answering these questions for your scenes when you want to deploy video. So uh, one way to do it is uh, uh, for clarity is, and for avoiding problems with 3D performance, is uh, simply make it launchable. And uh, the launch option right here says, OK, you want to see a video? Fine, click here, and I'll push it out in your browser, web browser, and then it'll run independently where things are pretty well behaved. And then the 3D scene is not getting interrupted by that. Uh, it's, it's interesting as graphics cards improve, some people would say as they run out of things to do, uh, we're seeing these days uh, a lot more attention to video performance in graphics acceleration hardware. And I think it's only a, a short step away before they start paying attention to the combination of video and uh, 3D running together. Some of the most uh, uh, Impressive examples at the SIGGRAPH conference this year were some uh, not only uh, high bandwidth or high quality video, but live video from the webcam streaming straight into the uh, scene. The Instant Reality guys uh, showed that. It's uh, uh, stellar performance, full frame rate, and they even uh, showed uh, a beta version ported to the iPhone doing the same thing. And uh, pretty cool. Okay, what else? Well, just as with image texture, we need to care about what formats do we use. And 
video is a particularly uh, encumbered arena, encumbered by patents, uh, and a whole variety, a whole uh, smorgasbord of formats, some of which are free, many of which are not, many of which have obscure licensing fees. One of my favorite ones to avoid uh, is uh, the file format that says, you can get the first 50,000 views for free. Gosh, that sounds good, doesn't it? 50,000 views, my goodness. Okay, until we go into, say, a university or a government context, and then uh, start asking questions like, um, uh, who, who's counting? Who do we pay to count, or, 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 or who, how do we set up our servers to do that? And, and oh, oh yes, and when some of our videos get to 50,000, which, which would be our most popular and most important videos, right? But, uh, and, and then when we stop serving them, who, who pays to renew that? Okay, so it's great to have high, high performance new technology. It's not so great when, when there's no way to execute. Sometimes this is called uh, the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. So you have to, you do have to worry about this stuff, and this is why, uh, for better or worse, we only have a couple of formats specified for uh, X3D as required required formats. In fact, we only really have one, and that's MPEG, which I think can be uh, universally acknowledged to be. Uh, uh, perhaps the least capable and most uh, bandwidth hogging, least quality version of the many that are out there. But it's one of the few that's properly standardized and royalty free for any use. And that's why it's in the spec, because you can be guaranteed that any viewer will be able to play it. Because it's required. If they don't, they're not conforming. Uh, are other formats allowed? Sure, sure, just like before. But you'd have to check on a browser by browser basis whether or not it's supported. So then you're asking questions like, well, where is my scene going? And where is the movie going with that? And what kind of installations do they have? And can they upgrade? And is there some way to encourage them to one browser or the other? So this is where our uh, URL list becomes very important because you can list multiple versions now. You could put the more exotic or more performant versions first, hoping that the browser supports it, and maybe they will. There are some formats that are fairly common. And then put an MPEG encoding of that same video last so that there's a fallback for it. So there is quite a bit of work going on in this space, as you might guess. Um, I don't see uh, either Web3D Consortium or World Wide Web Consortium, for that matter, approving or requiring any formats unless they do go royalty-free. If you want to learn more about this, uh, we have some stuff in the minutes uh, all about that that goes through this, excuse me, not the minutes, in the, in the notes section that tells you some of the things going on and where you can find out more information. And in fact, uh, we've got a position paper uh, that Matthias Kolch uh, uh, helped me put together that uh, talks about what are the requirements for web video? What would be the proper things to have uh, both within uh, 3D uh, that has video within it or perhaps 3D that's within a video? Uh, different ways of putting these things together. Okay. Um, so what are the fields then on the movie texture now? Well, we said that uh, most are the same. Certainly the URL list is the same, but we also have some more that are unique to movie textures. Uh, we can speed up a, a uh, movie, make it go faster or slower. We can also make it go in reverse if we give it a negative speed, which is pretty cool. Start time and stop time, pause time, resume time, 
these are time events that we might use from a touch sensor or from some other triggering device to make things go or make things stop. So we'll see, uh, at least in the advanced course, we've got a few examples. Uh, one's called DVD controller, which is interesting, which is a, a prototype that uh, does these kinds of things. Uh, we also have is active and is paused are uh, Boolean events that can be used to uh, start or stop or pause uh, or at least reflect the status of something. So uh, when we get to the events chapter, we'll learn how to hook those things up. Duration changed and elapsed time are two other helpful output events where you can keep track of how long is my movie clip or how far has it played in there? And so we can um, keep track of uh, those things. Load sensor is another helpful tool. Again, this is a, these are event passing things, but what load sensor does is it takes any of its children and waits until they are fully loaded. Okay, so you could use this as an author to say, I don't want my animation to start until I know the movie is loaded and beginning to play. Since that might widely vary by end users, load sensor would be the way to keep track of it. Then uh, regardless of uh, uh, all of these event things, one thing to pay attention to when you use movies now is if you want the same movie more than one time, please deafen use it because they're big, they hog a lot of performance, they can chew up your disk space. So perfect uh, use case for putting in uh, deaf and used copies. Similar to uh, uh, image texture, we have the same considerations about whether material should be underneath it. It might be less jarring if you have a material color to be a place soldier, so there's not a big white blob in the middle of your world, but rather something that blends into the background until the movie appears. And then uh, heads up, if there is uh, some transparent texture, uh, pixel, some transparent pixels in your movie texture, then uh, you might see the material underneath. Okay, so here's our example. You can see from the snapshot that we have our uh, fancy schmancy new uh, URL editor. Let's uh, take a close up of that and uh, then uh, take a look at the scene. Uh, and these are the results we're going to get. So let's look at the scene. Here we go. So it's in the same chapter, the movie, the file's called Movie Texture Authoring Options. And if we go down in here and we find a movie texture node, Okay, there's one of several. Let's uh, pull up the editor. And we see all of the uh, parameters that we talked about before. Oh, I failed to mention one loop. Uh, can we put that in the notes to make sure the minutes, or make sure the slides include a description of the loop parameter? Um, and then we can list different URLs here. I really like this uh, URL editor. It, uh, it helps simplify what you're doing. You can also uh, push things up or down, add or subtract new entries. And we can even uh, test entries by launching them. Okay, so if we wanted to make sure that this uh, movie worked, we could launch it in the browser if we're using the URL editor for something else, we could use the open key <coughs> to stick it in X3 to edit. Okay, so there's uh, one of several videos that we've included in there. Um, let's see what's left on this guy. I guess that's about it. So we don't want to open it because we're not opening it. And there is no uh, pixel texture for movies which is uh, probably a good thing, because if uh, images are growing by 25 times, a movie <coughs> just is a single string uh, 
hexadecimal values would be horrendous. Okay, now let's look at what this looks like. Uh, not so good. We've got a bug report in. I uh, copied the mailing list on that. But uh, looking at most of the browsers, they, uh, they are failing on this guy. The top scene shows the entry view, and what we have is two sets of videos. The first video is in standard definition, uh, uh, four by three. The second set is in uh, high definition, 16 by nine aspect ratio. And so the first guy is uh, uh, just the image on a, on, a, on a texture. The second one is a, a used copy of it, but on top of a billboard. And then finally, the last one is not a movie at all, but an image with a parent anchor node. And if we zoom in on the viewpoints, we can see each one. So we'll do that in a moment. Here's the primary artifact to see right now, or coming on is, hey, it's cut off. And it's, it's, it's uh, stretched vertically and then cut off. That's not so good. So I think uh, there's some mix up about pixel size. Pixels themselves have a four to three uh, aspect ratio. So I think there's some mix up in the browsers and it's quite curious that most of them seem to have the same error. So I won't rule out that it might not be uh, in our scene, but we just posted this this morning along with the examples. Let's go ahead just, just for the, the sheer fun of it. Let's uh, launch it in all the browsers and see how they do. Okay, so uh, Away we go here. They're launching at a one second interval. Uh, we can see, well, we've got one here. This is a swirl viewer, but it doesn't even support movies yet, but at least it took care of the images that were clickable and launchable. So at least for what they did, swirl was okay. Uh, XJ3D, our embedded uh, view in, in there has uh, good image texture support, but not uh, embedded movie support yet. That's still a problem with the open source job. Um, what else? We've got, uh, surprisingly, uh, surprising to me anyway, uh, instant reality didn't work so well on this. And so bug report submitted publicly reported. Let's take a look at Vivity. Okay, if we click to run, sure enough, they do run. Click to run. That runs too, but they, we still have the uh, uh, warping and cutoff problem. Let's, uh, let's put in the notes that there's another interesting uh, difference between all these guys. Some are coming up black and some are coming up with the first screen. So we need to check the specification to make sure that's consistent. If I go through the viewpoints here, you can see what we've tried to do on the viewpoints is uh, the first one is our entry screen, but then we walk through each of the six spots. And this is a good practice. When you have a video, you should uh, uh, put a viewpoint so you can view it. Now this one, viewing straight on, that's great. This one, uh, I should say the next one, um, when we go to the second movie, this is also a movie, but it's billboarded. And notice how my viewpoint is off to the side. Uh, and uh, however, I can rotate around the scene. And because it's billboarded to always stay facing me, the uh, uh, movie stays pretty consistent. Let's go to the next guy. Image three is just an image. So that's a, a screen snapshot I took of the video. The screen snapshot itself uh, is not broken. Let's, uh, let's prove that by going back into X3D Edit. And we can test any one of these. Okay, here's our image texture screen snapshot. We'll bring up the uh, editor again and we can say, oh, okay, so let's launch that. Oh, so it's a good screen snapshot. So whatever warping is going on is external. We can also uh, take advantage of the open button here. X3D Edit will let you open images and look at that. So it says with confidence as it fails. Let's try uh, 
the PNG. Okay, new bug. That should have worked. Let's uh, drop it in manually. Okay, so there we could bring up images in X3D edit. Okay, so uh, we've gone through, well, the punchline, I guess, on that one, after testing the images, we can click on this and the anchor selects it and hands it off to the browser. It says, do you really want to play this in the browser? Yes, I do. X3D. So there it is, and uh, that works. Okay, let's confirm now that we're done with movie texture. Yep, that's it. Tooltips. Okay, so there's the movie texture segment. There's still one more to go. Okay, one more, one more piece on movie texture. We did get the problem fixed, and it's an interesting one. Here we see some screen snapshots of the scene. Once again, uh, uh, we have three versions of it, both in, uh, in the first row. We have a, a clickable straight-on uh, texture, and then we have a billboarded straight-on texture, and then we just simply have a, an image that you can click and launches the movie in an external scene. We do that first for standard definition, and then in the second row we do it for high definition. And so uh, there are viewpoints for each one, and this the bottom snapshots show you examples of those, including uh, on the right here, the uh, the uh, billboarded version, notice how everything else is twisted around here uh, flat against where it is, but we, as, as we navigate the scene, it stays pretty local uh, for the user. So what was the trick to get there? Well, uh, uh, a debatable issue actually. Uh, if we look in the scene, we can see that the piece we added was a texture coordinate node. And uh, what that did was define the S and T coordinates for, uh, let me get that right, define the S and T coordinates for a uh, rectangle. So if we break those down, it's 0, 0, uh, 1, 0. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1. So those are the uh, four corners in s and coordinates for a texture, and that forces the browser to use those when it maps it to, to uh, the rectangle that we put it to. Now, you might well ask, and I, I certainly ask, why the heck did we have to bother with that? Because when we just drop an image texture in, it works. And the answer, at least for now, is reading the spec, the fine details in there, it looks like there's some ambiguities, that it leaves some choices up to browsers. And as a result, everybody was doing the right thing for image texture, but maybe not doing the right thing for movie texture. So. Uh, a good point has been raised, and we're uh, off to fix it on the uh, X3D working group list and decide if a specification clarification is needed or if uh, there's a, a better default or what. But in any case, uh, that's how you can fix it for your movie, and we have a good example now on the movie textures. Questions on that? Okay. Uh...